welcome back. We will be discussing now the conduct and weaning process of cardiopulmonary bypass. So again, in brief, we see this process every day, just putting it in writing in here. Generally speaking, the way I look at it is conduction is achieved via four cardinal steps. Weaning is achieved also via four steps. They, they, they occur in series, so it's like a cycle. So you start by establishing the circuit, going on bypass, checking the parameters. If you're happy, then you stop the heart and the lungs. Weaning is going backwards, so you stop, you restart the heart and the lungs, you check the parameters. If you're happy, you stop the bypass, and then you dismantle the circuit. Looking at it, so establishing the circuit will involve setting it up. We discussed that in the circuit architecture. We explained how the circuit looks like. We explained it in sequence, how the perfusion is set it up. Then priming and heparinization. Um, then you go on bypass, you check the parameters. If satisfactory, you stop the heart. On the other side, weaning is again four steps. You start by restarting the heart and the lungs. You, in order to do that, you need to rewarm the heart, de air the heart facing and ventilation to be started. Then you check if the criteria of weaning is achievable. Then you gradually come down. If happy, you dismantle the circuit. Bearing in mind, you need precautions to be able to go back on bypass if you have to. Let's start one step at a time. As we said, four steps for conduct, four steps for weaning. So the first step in conduct, uh, setup of the circuit, we will not discuss that. We will start by priming. Setting the circuit, I mean the setup itself, we discuss that in the circuit section. Now, let's start by priming and hypnotization. Priming, why do we need to prime? Um, blood needs to flow into a fluid rather than flowing into the solid container to reduce the SRS effect. Also, you need the fluid to be um, in the circuit to be able to de-air the circuit. You start with an empty container, empty tubes, it's full of air. You need to de-air the circuit before you start and hence you need the priming. So initially, the tubes of the venous and arterial side are in continuity. You fill the circuit with some fluids via the uh, ports of the container, and then you start running and expelling the air out. It goes through the sideway. You condense all the air at the top bit of the reservoir. So you fill it with fluid enough to fill the whole circuit. So you start by instance by putting down um, around one and a half or two liters. And this is sufficient to go all around the tubes and the container and sitting at the end, leaving the, empty, the top part of the container empty. Uh, by this, you are expelling all the air out. Air is confined at the top point of the container. The, the point where uh, the fluid uh, uh, starts is called the level below which no air must be uh, uh, present if air is present in the uh, uh, arterial side that's what we call air embolism if air is present on the venous side that's what we call air lock um, there are various ways to for priming various protocols for priming one of the common protocols or the one used in my center in our center is for uh, 500 mils of crystalloid 500 mils of colloid and 250 mils of mannitol or you can calculate the mannitol by weight that is 0.5 milligrams per kg uh, um, uh, why that um, studies have shown that mannitol reduces the incidence of uh, uh, renal dysfunction post-operative other alternative protocols include, uh, for instance, uh, priming with uh, cross-matched blood, um, uh, group-specific and cross-matched blood. Or you might use the patient's own blood, uh, that is retrograde autologous uh, uh, priming, that is, once you go on bypass, you open the clamp in the arterial line, allowing the blood to go flow back into the container, um, uh, and then you start the, uh, the circuit. Um, this has had the drawback, of course, that you need to withdraw from the patient at least a liter or um, around a liter of blood, which might compromise the patient. Sometimes hemodynamically, patients cannot... Um, withstand this, uh, but it's one of the ways to reduce the amount of uh, priming crystalloid solution or the priming solution. Making it more blood uh, will also increase the hematocrit of the patient at the end of the surgery. Heparinization, why are we heparinizing? Because this is a non endothelial surface. If blood contacts this uh, without heparin, there will be massive clotting and coagulation. All the uh, pathways will be uh, extrinsic and intrinsic pathways will all be uh, activated and you will have massive clotting you must have heparinization heparinization also follows a protocol so the initial dose during surgery and at the end so initial dose you give 300 units uh, per kg or you give uh, three grams per kg 
it's the same thing three grams are 300 units during the surgery you need to check uh, uh, therapeutic act so act needs to be more than 300 seconds to go on bypass needs to be on more than 400 sec uh, sorry needs to be more than 300 to cannulate and open and start the suckers needs to be more than 400 to go on bypass more than 480 to go in deep hypothermic arrest or circ arrest and then act is checked every 30 minutes on bypass um, um, if it falls below four uh, 400 or 480 depending on the center uh, you give extra 500 units hence you always hear the anesthetist at the end of the surgery asking the perfusionist whether they're given any extra uh, uh, heparin so that they can calculate at the end the protamin uh, uh, dose so at the end you need to reverse the heparin you're given by giving protamin one gram for every hundred units you need to calculate how much total heparin you give through the surgery and you give one gram for every hundred units step two this and step one we set up the circuit now we are going on bypass going on bypass involves a view uh, uh, a dialogue between the surgeon and the uh, perfusionist um, um, hence it's uh, accustomed in a lot of centers the perfusionist sitting on in front of the surgeon um, back ago the perfusionist used to sit behind the surgeon it's still used either way some centers um, uh, some centers prefer this or that kind of orientation of uh, the theater however sitting in front of the surgeon had the benefit of during this step that is going on bypass it's a dialogue between the surgeon and the perfusionist so as we said the venous and the arterial lines are in continuity and at the beginning to de-air the circuit now you need to divide them and uh, start uh, cannulating the patient and um, uh, in that uh, in at that particular step the surgeon must confirm with the perfusion that the pump is off and uh, um, uh, and uh, the venous lines are clamped why that pump is off otherwise the pump will be under pressure once uh, if the pump is is, is pumping while you are uh, clamping your arterial side the pressure in the tube will be rising once you divide the line you will get a splash of blood uh, of course the pump will not break because there is a pressure detector which will stop the pump um, if the pressure goes too high but it will still pressurize the tube and hence create a splash of blood just a squirt of blood once you cut the tube second the venous line needs to be clamped uh, otherwise the fluid will, of the venous line will siphon back the perfusionist opens it in a in a in a controlled manner to uh, pull the blood back until the preferred length and then the surgeon starts cutting it again that's a communication between the surgeon and the perfusionist then um, uh, uh, after before connecting the uh, the lines immediately the surgeon instructs the perfusionist to, to kindly come around that is to de-air the last tip of the uh, arterial line and uh, to take back the venous cannula uh, release the clamp on the venous side to pull back the blood hence um, be able to tailor the uh, required length of the venous cannula as we explained Finally, connecting the arterial line to the aortic cannula, you need to confirm two things with the perfusionist. One is a good swing and a good pressure. Good swing means that the cannula is in continuity with the arterial um, um, uh, with the arterial lumen, hence you know it's in the right place. Also, good pressure means that it's not in an inappropriate position. We will explain that later on. Third step, now we are on bypass. The third step is checking the parameters before you switch off the heart this of course happens routinely it's more a smooth uh, kind of uh, uh, affluent uh, process but in order to understand for academic reasons you need to bear in mind once you go and bypass you need to check two main points what's happening before the heart and what's happening after the heart before the heart which we refer to as drainage and after the heart which we refer to as perfusion you need to check these parameters always look at three things the body the heart and the pump so for drainage, we're looking at the CVP. If the CVP gone to negative or at maximum of two, that means you've got adequate drainage. If you go on bypass and your, and your CVP is 10, that means there is something wrong with your venous cannula. Now the heart, uh, you need to have a look uh, at the right, uh, right side of the heart. It needs to be fully decompressed. Finally, the pump, the perfusionist should have enough uh, level in the reservoir. That means you have achieved good drainage. 
On the other side, looking at the perfusion section, again looking at the uh, uh, body, heart, and pump. Looking at the body, you need good perfusion pressure, you need good MAPS, that is 50 to 70 usually is adequate. Oxygen saturation needs to be 95 to 100%. Heart, you need to look at the aorta. Aorta is not um, looking as if there is an aortic dissection, that is a hematoma a bit distant to the aortic cannulation site. And um, uh, the pump, the arterial line pressure should be maximum of 300 uh, millimeter of mercury and a, a main pump flow of uh, being able to achieve a full flow that is 2.2 to 2.4 uh, for index to the body mass index so liter per meter square it's not unheard of going on bypass finding yourself with inadequate drainage seeing the right atrium filling cvp is high um, perfusion is complaining of not sufficient uh, uh, level or on the other side um, not being achieving good maps uh, iatrogenic dissection has occurred for instance or the oxygen sets the blood looks blue um, uh, because the o the the oxygen switch for instance is not working well it it all all these has happened so um, although they are uh, not as common these days because of the um, advance in technology you must always bear in mind those are the things you need to look at before after body heart and pump body heart and pump okay um, uh, step three uh, also includes confirming uh, satisfactory bypass we explained that now what problems could be happening um, so if you're having inappropriate drainage what do you think about we understood what's appropriate drainage what happens if you get inappropriate drainage you think about the cannula you think about the heart miscellaneous effects and the disaster the same happens the same applies in inappropriate perfusion i put them in a comparable manner so if the cannula is a small size of course now we have shards so before you go on bypass you ask the perfusionist according to the body mass index there is a way to calculate it there is a um, uh, he tells you what's the proper size for cannula but for instance you put the cannula you feel it is of uh, smaller size it's highly unlikely but if it if it is the case you need to revisit that also in appropriate position the cannula is not uh, draining well it's kinked it's outside uh, it's not in the proper position you need to address that taking it to a further step the heart maybe the heart is underfilled the circulation the cvp to start with wasn't um, uh, high enough and hence you will not be achieving good venous return you need to fill the heart or in appropriate position the heart is kinked or turned or some sort obscuring the venous return one of the ways to improve your venous return is always raising the table table position always remember that's the first thing you think about once you have an airlock raise the table it will help to flush the air out of course you need to lift the tubes but remember raising the table a few centimeters up could help to flush this air out so remember the table position also vacuum uh, put it, asking the perfusions to put uh, some vacuum on the venous uh, return also helps maximum of minus 60 you don't want to put too much otherwise you will create venous tug which uh, induces hemolysis also there might be a disaster if you are unfortunate enough you might be encountering ivc tear during cannulation during insertion of the cannula which will also obscure your venous return comparably speaking in appropriate perfusion this could be a problem with the mostly with the cannula or a disaster so either the cannula is hitting an anathrometous plaque just wiggling it a bit or moving it will help or abutting the posterior wall just pulling it a little bit back uh, repositioning the cannula mainly if you are unlucky enough you might have put the cannula selectively into one of the arch branches or even pierced the back wall and gone through the back wall of the heart um, a disaster is always an aortic dissection as i said you find out that with low perfusion and you can see a hematoma distant to the cannulation site step four is stopping the heart and the lungs if everything is fine you're happy with drainage happy with perfusion happy with your bypass you achieved good cardiopulmonary bypass you can stop the cardio and pulmonary sections you can stop the heart by myocardial protection you can stop the lungs by switching off the ventilator and that's what the anesthetist is sometimes called the golden hour then weaning going back again in four steps so first step is restarting the heart and the uh, uh, restarting the heart and the lungs so starting by restarting the heart you need to rewarm the heart 
um, as we explained, we uh, uh, we uh, we use hypothermia as an element of protection, and hence you need to rewarm the circulation. Bear in mind, cooling is faster than rewarming. Cooling is achieved systemically and locally, as well as rewarming is achieved systemically and locally. Systemically by the heater cooler machine, Lo topically. In the case of cooling, you apply topical uh, crystalloid. Back ago, it used to be uh, ice slush, however, rarely used now because of the more incidence of phrenic nerve injury. Rewarming is achieved topically via the bear hugger or the endotherm uh, blankets. Beware during rewarming, it takes longer, so the proper timing is 0.3 to 0.5 uh, degrees uh, every minute. If you cool, Faster than that, you st you you risk creating emboli. You risk also uh, uh, denature. If you uh, rewarm higher than the physiological temperature, you uh, you risk de uh, denaturating the uh, plasma proteins. Um, now, also in the process of restarting the heart, you need to de-air. Um, uh, you need to uh, de-air. So I always remember this this way. You rewarm to go off bypass. You de-air to remove the cross clamp. So um, and hence restart the heart, of course. So uh, de-airing. Uh, this is a small diagram I postulated in here in order to explain the de-airing process. Now, when you commence bypass, you are bypassing between the two arms of the circuit. That is the venous side and the aortic cannula. The area in between considering the fact it's a closed area, is uh, air vacuum space. Um, any breach will suck air into that. So the area between the right heart, the lungs, and the left heart is an air vacuum space. Now you are breaching it, you're doing an AVR, you're doing even cabbage, you're doing whatever, any kind of surgery, mitral valve, tricuspid valve, anything in this area will suck air into the space. How do we de-air that? We just reverse, as you can see here, we are reversing the direction of flow of blood. So first of all, number one step, you um, uh, you uh, inhibit or reduce the amount of venous uh, cannulation return. By that, you're filling blood into the right heart, and then this blood will naturally, and then you start by massaging the right heart, so pushing this blood to the lungs, and then asking the perfusion, uh, the anesthetist to kindly blow the lungs, this will push the blood to the left side of the heart. Again, you are massaging it, hence enabling the blood to be expelled to the aortic root where the aortic root vent will pick it up. So practically speaking, you are just pushing the air out using the blood. So as you can see, the air vacuum space, you're reversing the direction of flow, venous cannula, right heart going to the lung, massaging the left side of the heart and allowing the vacuum, uh, uh, the uh, root vent to pick it up. Once you're satisfactory, the root vent shows less bubbles or no bubbles. You are then, you can then remove the clamp, keeping the uh, root vent running for some time, depending on how much de-airing you wish to achieve. So in, in, in simple terms, filling the heart, allowing RV to eject, expelling air um, uh, to the pulmonary valve, then uh, pushing it away from the lungs, running the LV vent, removing the cross clamp. Also, you might use your surgical field to create the, um, uh, to de-air, for instance, an aortotomy, using that as an exit point for the air, using the atriotomy as an exit point. The air must exit at some point. You're flushing it with blood using any exit point, or in, for congenital surgery, using the PFO, whatever. Any point through this journey, you are flushing the air with the blood. Step two, now we restarted the heart. Of course, restarting the lung is by starting the ventilator back on. So now we restarted the heart. Um, step two is confirming suitability for weaning. I would like to think about it as two no's, two satisfactories and two physiological. No conditions requiring bypass, no uh, air which requiring still de-airing. Then uh, two physiological, that is physiological temperature and physiological gases, that is the ABG potassium PO2. Two satisfactory, that is a satisfactory pacing and satisfactory ventilation. You might be putting pacing on, but it's not working well. You need to sort that out before going off bypass. Also ventilation, you might have turned the ventilator on, but the lung is not coming up. You need to sort that out. Then 
step uh, three, we are ready now to go to gradually land or gradually go off by pass. How you do that? Starting by cr gradual clamping of the venous line, hence more blood is sitting in the heart than in the pump. Of course, once you do that, you're reducing the amount of level, so the perfusions will naturally have to reduce the flow rate. So gradually clamping, more blood in the heart, the heart will start ejecting blood. You can see that on the arterial line. The surgeon needs to be visualizing the right ventricle and the right side of the heart um, uh, to achieve the best filling or the, the best stretch of the myocardium to be able to contract at the highest point of the starling low, uh, of the starling curve, sorry. So the, uh, the surgeon here, there is again a dialogue between the surgeon and the perfusionist. The perfusionist keeps on inhibiting or reducing the amount of venous return by the clamping and reducing the pump flow to not run out of level. Once you achieve satisfactory filling of the heart, you slow down the flow until eventually you increase the gradual, gradual clamping, reduce the uh, pump flow, eventually you will have totally clamped venous line and totally switched off pump. That's how you go down on bypass. Finally, dismantling the circuit, but bearing in mind you must have a precaution to be able to go back on bypass at any point of time. One, venous cannula is out, you, however you leave the purse strings. Two, you take the re uh, root vent out again, but this is only done after you perform a TOE on table uh, to uh, confirm uh, there is uh, no residual air. Also, um, a water cannula is taken out and uh, um, after only giving protamine and achieving satisfactory filling. Once you do that, you are safe, you are happy, you start hemostasis and closing the chest. Um, the precautions also you need to be taking, bearing in mind. So once the venous cannula is out, the uh, scrub nurse or the assistant, second assistant fills the venous line with crystalloid solution that is uh, to uh, siphon the line. Um, perfusionist checks uh, heparinization, occlusion and reservoir level and hence be able to go on bypass if we have to. And the surgeon, as, I, as we said, leaves the purse rings until the very end. This concludes the uh, uh, conduct and weaning section. I hope you benefit from this. I leave you here with this um, uh, MCQ uh, question. I hope we could meet again in the emergency scenario, the final section of cardiopulmonary bypass. Thank you very much.